little bit about worship last week, and I got sidetracked. I don't know if it was just me or the Lord. I'm, I'm blaming it on the Lord because I, I want to do, I want to say whatever he wants me to say. And so I, I want him to use me like that. So we got into anger last week, and it seemed to be appropriate. I got a few comments, and, and I'm, I'm good that um, we approached a very <laughs> uh, sore subject for some, anger and how we handle it. But I'm still trying to get a handle on worship and what is it. There's a lot of people that use that word, and they use it uh, in many different uh, aspects. So I'm going to try to, to hone down on what exactly is it. Proskuneo is the Greek word for worship. Proskuneo. Say that with me. Proskuneo. Proskuneo. All right. Now quit speaking in tongues. Okay. That's not going to happen here. I heard you speaking Greek right there. All right. Anyway, it, it means to lay, literally, to lay on the floor or on the ground. It means to prostrate oneself. Now all you guys are going to go, did he say prostate? No. I said prostrate. Two different wholly different ideas of, of one's an organ in a man's body and uh, one is uh, is worship. It's about spreading out and abasing yourself, humbling yourself and that is um, if this is going to be a little awkward for me okay, well up here and down there um, you already did that, okay <laughs> The idea of proskuneo is this. Let's say, for example, somebody has come broken into your house and they have said, I'm, I'm going to kill you if you don't give me all of your money. And at that point, you realize you don't have any money. So you've got to beg for your life. So what do you do? This is the idea. You sprawl, you get as close to the ground as you can, and you beg for your life. You don't look them straight in the eye. You get down on the ground, you put your face on the ground, and you beg, you crawl up to them, and you beg for your life. That is proskuneo. That is the position of proskuneo, and that is the attitude of someone so much greater than me that I am approaching for a favor that I, that I may not get. Is complete submission before power. You get that? Now, you know who the power is, right? You know who the power is. And you know who needs that power. <laughs> That's all of us. I want to share a story with you now from the Old Testament. It's a story of a guy, a very familiar guy, named Abram. You may know him as Abraham, but he didn't become Abraham because most of the story is about Abram until... He did something, and God blessed him and gave him a brand new name. So I'm going to read you the story of Abram, uh, and that's going to be the basis of our lesson today. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down. See that? He fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. That's Abraham. Will be in the future. Abraham, father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, which means exalted father. Your name will be Abraham, father of many nations. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you are now, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give to you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. Let's get a little backstory about uh, Abra Abram and, and what happened to him, and he's soon to be called Abraham. When he was 75 years old, the Lord spoke to him, and it seemed that uh, uh, there were other gods in his family. His, his father, Terah, had other gods. And in this day and age, it was called the patriarchal age. The patriarchs 
where the, the male head of the household, presumably the, the uh, oldest male head of the household, still living, and he became the head of the tribe. So you, you see how that works. Abram now is the head of the house since his dad died. And God spoke directly to the heads of the houses. God spoke directly to Abraham, as you just saw in the previous verse right there. He said in Genesis 12, 1 through 5, The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai. She wasn't Sarah yet. You know her as Sarah. Sarai is her name before that. She, her name's going to get changed too. His nephew Lot, who was the son of his deceased brother Haran, or Haran, one out, one out, Haran. So Haran was his brother who had died, and this was his son. So he took him in to his family, and there he was, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. There must have been something about Abram to, to, a, to a, uh, get him into the focus of God. Something special. So Abraham listens to the Lord and travels blindly to an undetermined place. Let's see if Abram is really all that special. Okay, let's say he had a, uh, let's say you had a dream last night and the angel Michael spoke to you and said that in the morning you should pack your bags and you should leave all of your family and friends and your, your house and, and your uh, area. You just get in your car and you just go somewhere. An angel was telling you that, right? Oh, and the angel might have spoken about blessings and, and protection, but no destination. Would you go? That's, that's a tough one, isn't it? Because, you know, we got roots, right, Brenda? We got roots. That's, that, and I think Abraham had roots. He had the place where his brother was buried, where his father was buried, and all of that that was back there. And, and that's where he grew up. <clears throat> and he was asked to leave. It wasn't so easy, was it? If you put yourself in that position, it wasn't so easy. But aren't you a little adventurous, even a little bit? It's God making all the promises, right? It's God doing that. You do believe in God, don't you? Okay, and you do believe he has angels and that he sends them down to do his ministry. Oh, but I want you to know where I'm going and how I will make money to buy food. I, I, I really need to know some of the details, Lord. So angel, let me shake you a little bit. And I, can you tell me exactly how long it's going to take? Can you tell me exactly how much it's going to cost? Because I only have so much in my, my purse here. I can only drag so much gold and silver and stuff with me. I've only got so much deodorant. I might run out on the journey. What happens then? Toothpaste. Do you think that God knows what he's doing? Do you think he knows what he's doing when he asks you to go? Let's agree that Abram is a unique man and that his wife and his nephew are also kind of unique people to follow him because they, they didn't get the message. They're, they're taking his word for it that he actually spoke to God or God spoke to him. Now, one more try at this dream thing. Let's, let's, let's try another angel. The angel tells you you've won a lottery for two billion dollars come on joey say amen to that and the winning ticket is in the north pole and you have to leave immediately to drive up north with no phone and uh, no no boss no neighbors two billion waiting for you if you go right now would you go is, is that a little different look well, there's a destination there's a great big reward at the end right and two billion, man, you can you can borrow money from strangers all the way, bum, bum your way up there. Two billion, pay them all back, man, you know, 40, 40, 100 times what they gave you. I guess it would be different if you believe that the story that the angel told you. Well, that's who, that's who Abram is, though. He didn't have all that billion dollars at the end of the tunnel. He just knew that God said, I will bless you. He didn't know what that meant either. He couldn't know at that point because God hadn't done anything like that before. Abram is special in the story of God. 
Abram believed God. He believed the conversation to be true, and he acted on it. So the journey, be the journey begins for this mass of people and animals and possessions, this big, long entourage of stuff, and, and they're traveling, and they're going up north, not to the North Pole, but they're just going towards Canaan because he had just come from Egypt. So he's, he's, he's traveling all, all over the place. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is when the weather turns ugly. This is where Egypt comes in. The weather turns ugly, and there's a famine. There's no rain. And on a desert, if you get no rain, guess what? Nobody gets to eat. Things die. The plants die first. The plants die. The animals can't sustain. They die. It's not a great way to go. So apparently down in the Nile, down around Cairo or somewhere in Egypt, there was enough grass for this big monstrous entourage that he had. So he ends up in Egypt. Well, is, is he like us? Politics are a little crazy down here in Egypt. Let me tell you what's going on. There's a king, and anybody strange that comes into town, he gets to check out their women. <laughs> he gets to pick the prettiest ones and put them in his little harem in there. And that's just the way, that's political. Wow, that's kind of crazy. Abram knew it when he came down there, but what could he do? That's where the grass was. That's where his animals, that's where he could, if his livestock were fed and watered, then he could eat. And his whole family, the servants and all of that, they could all eat. Now at this point, he and his wife, they don't have any babies. She's not been pregnant. She's not able to, to conceive. Just that's all the Bible says. She's not, I don't know what, what's wrong with her or, or what. But anyhow, so, so but she's pretty. She's a, she's a, uh, uh, what, what would be a good term to say? A beautiful, beautiful woman. She's a knockout. She's a babe. She's a sweet, what is it? Hot mama. She's a hot mama. She's a hot mama on the back of a big old camel. Coming into Egypt, Pharaoh goes, whoa, check out that. Like, anyhow, Pharaoh, Abraham, Abram said this to his wife. He says, hey, Sarah, Sarai, listen, down here, they look at pretty women, and you are a knockout. You are a hot mama. Hot baby, hot something, hot potato. You're a hot potato. Hot. You're, you're a hot something, hot, hot something. He's, and he says, look, I don't want them to kill me to take you. That's what they're going to do. They're going to kill me so that they can have you because if I'm the husband and they find out I'm the husband, then, then they're going to kill me. But if, they, but if I tell them that I'm your brother, which is kind of true because they're, they're kind of related, step, you know, this kind of thing. It, there wasn't too many families to choose from with, when you're talking about marriage and all that. So cousins and brother, you know, anyhow, they were literally, uh, it, was, it was her brother, sort of. And so that was the story. And sure enough, Pharaoh came and got her. And Abraham, I can't, Abram, I can't believe he wasn't a messed up, a hot mess at home. Because there's his wife in the Pharaoh's court, and he's got to imagine, oh, my God, what's going on with the Pharaoh? So, okay, here's God. What did he say? He said, I'll protect you. He said, I'll bless you. What does he do? He gives old Pharaoh a rash that he can't, he can't hardly scratch it. I don't, I don't know where, where or what kind of disease he got. But he got some kind of disease, and he knew that God... The God of Abram was the God who had, had told him, this is not his sister. This is his wife. What you're doing, and this is something that Pharaoh came to know. We don't know how he knew it, but because the, the scripture I read didn't tell. But I believe the Lord sent an angel to him. And in his sleep, he got the news. Hey, she's bad news. Sarai has to go back. So Pharaoh's mad. He's got whatever's wrong with him is wrong with him. And he's... He's got something wrong with him. And he says, get rid of this woman. Get rid of this man. You get your stuff and you get out of here. So they go up towards Canaan. He did tell a lie about his marital status. But God was faithful. And God took care of business. You know, Abraham, Abram, I'll, I'll do that all through this. Abram was a guy like us. He wasn't much different. Seriously, you look at him now. What, he lied a little bit? You know, you just commit to save his skin. Okay, it was a worthy cause, right? He only lied to say, hey, I just don't want to die right now, okay? I'm a little young. I'm only 78 years old or whatever. And in those days, you can have babies at 75. I guess these days you still can, but it's really not the right time. 75 is a little past the, the prime of life there. But in this days, you know, they were living to be 200. They were living to be 200. So that was his, his uncles were 200 and some of them almost 300. Uh, Abraham. So this is when, after the flood, all of the life expectancy started going down. 
All because they started eating beef. Mm -hmm. They started butchering cattle. They, they were vegetarians before that. That was for free. That wasn't in here. So, so they head up and they, they're up to this place uh, next to Hebron and Ai, which is close to kind of the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee and those, those kind of places over there in the Middle East. And then they're close. And he's, uh, they're up on the high ground. And all of a sudden, there's not enough grass to go around. So Lot, you know, he's kind of a grown guy now. And he's, you know, he's in his 50s. And so he's, he's walking around. He's got sheep and camels and goats. And they all eat the same thing, grass and green things and all that. So, so this is the story that, that uh, there's not enough grass to go around. So the people that are working for Abraham and Lot, the two different people that are traveling together, they're talking to him, hey, get your cattle off. This is my ground. I'm trying to feed my sheep here. Get off. And they started calling each other names and getting into problems. So they went to both their, all their bosses, their respective bosses. One of them told, that was working for Abraham, said, Abram said, hey, lots of cows and goats and all that are eating all of our grass. There's not enough for us. So we're not, we're, we're having an issue here. I want you to go talk to your nephew and straighten him out on who the boss is here. And of course, the ones on Lot's side, hey, I want you to go tell your uncle what's going on here because we are starving to death over here. So Abram has this heart. He has, he don't want to fight with Lot. He don't want to fight with him. He wants Lot to, to thrive. He sees there's a problem, but he wants to solve the problem. And he's got such a great heart. So he tells Lot, Lot, look, let's don't fight about this. Why don't you go find an area? Look, look at all this land. Out here. Why don't you go find a place that you want to be? And I'll go the other direction. And we'll get far enough apart where our critters can eat their own grass and not get upset with, with uh, eating the others. Is that a deal? Lot said, yeah. So Abram, maybe he's like some of you. Maybe he's not. I want you to be more like him if you're not like this. Abram gave him first choice. You choose. Where do you want to go? What, where, where's the spot you want to be? So Lot's looking around. He goes down. Well, you know, down there, I see where the water flows and it kind of collects. A lot of green down there. I think I want to go down there into the valley. That's where five kings, Sodom and Gomorrah was one of them, were, were all down there. And they were down there where the rain comes and the, the ground's a lot more fertile and the topsoil falls off the mountain and ends up down there. And man, they got tall grass and they, they got great uh, vineyards and they've got all kinds of good stuff growing down there. So Lot goes, ah! That's for me. So he picks the best and goes down and collects for it. I don't think Lot was thinking too much about his uncle for him to do that. But he took him up on his offer, and you can't fault him for that. I mean, Abraham did offer, right? You choose first. You just got to wonder about Lot. I'd rather be like Abram than Lot. But Lot, and you know the story of Lot. We're not going to get into that today. But Abram then goes off, and he, he goes to the higher ground. And he, he goes over to the Canaan land, which is uh, to be in the future is going to be the place where Moses is going to deliver the, the children of Israel, his descendants, over to that place and give it to them. There's a war breaks out. The five kings down in the Delta, there's other kings all around there. And, and you know, Abram himself, he's kind of a king. He's got a lot of guys, you know, that not his children, but he's trained up some servants and slaves and, and just hired people along the way. He's trained them. They're soldiers, and they, they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty powerful. And people don't mess with him because he's got a lot of stuff. He takes up a big space on the planet. He hears about a lot being captured in a fight down there in the, in the Five King area, down in that lush area where Lot went. And he, he says, his family got to go help Lot. I like, I like Abram. Do you like him so far? He's thinking family. Blood is thicker than water. I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know what it's going to cost. But I am going to go get my nephew Lot. You can just see him. You know, all right. All right. Who's with me? Hey! You hear this big, you know, everybody rattling swords and, you know, doing all that, you know, stuff like that. And then, so they're going to go down. Well, guess what? The Lord said he would bless them. He would protect them. He would curse those who cursed him. Right? Remember all that? I don't know if that's even on Abram's heart right now, but that's still in God's heart. You know why? Because God remembers what he promises. He don't forget. This ain't something that just slips through the cracks for him. This isn't it. God does not have senior moments. Amen? Amen. He does not have senior moments. 
when you just forget what you told somebody that you would do for them. So Abram, he just gathers, gathers the strength of his own family and he marches down there against five kings, just him. He goes down there and he whoops them all, takes them all out. So the king of uh, Sodom says, uh, man, thanks. You, you know, take the spoils. You got five kingdoms down here. You, everything is valuable. Take it. It's all yours. Abram says, no, I'm not taking a thing. I'm not going to take anything from you. I didn't come down here. To, to, I came down here to rescue my nephew and his family and his stuff. And just because you happen to be in the same jailhouse as him, it's just because you were in the same prison camp as him, and I liberated him. You go ahead, have what you want, but I'm not going to take a thing. But he did say, I did have these guys that helped me do it, and so I want you to let them have their share. But as for me, I'm not taking anything. I just want Lot to be able to go back home and, and be safe. And that's why he did what he did. God, God is good, amen. amen. Abram's blessing from the Lord is giving Abram wealth and power. Something is missing. What's missing? After this, whew, she read ahead. She knows the story. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. See, I wasn't far off of that dream thing and an angel coming, was I? I wasn't far off of that. When you go to sleep, be ready. You might, you might get a visit. You might, you might learn something. You might get a little challenge when you're sleeping. All right, so he's having a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. <laughs> right? I'm having a vision. I'm sleeping, whatever. I'm not going to be afraid. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. It's a problem. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. I dare you to do that. Count the stars at night when it's really clear and you can see all the stars. Can you count them? It's, it's incredible. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So he has, how many children does he have right now? Zippo. How many is he going to have? So many, he can't even count them. Abram believed the Lord. Who would believe something like that? Olga, you're going to have 1,700 more children this month. Uh, well, the Lord told you that it would happen. You'd have to believe him. But it seems kind of incredible too. Abram, who'd been trying to have a baby all those years with his beautiful wife, and they just, she wouldn't, she couldn't conceive for whatever reason or another. He gave up. And here's God talking to a man who gave up on the idea that he'll ever get what he really wants. He gave up. And here's God telling him, I'm not only going to give you what you think you want, I'm going to give you way more than that. And Abram believed the Lord. And that's the difference between he and me. And he and you, maybe. He believed the Lord. He kind of took that word as if it was something very valuable and he took it into his heart and he took it with him. So this is going to happen. I don't know when, I don't know how, but it's going to happen. Abram, Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to, to him as righteousness. He was, he was good in God's eyes. Why? Because he believed God. That's interesting that, uh, that uh, the Lord is Abram's shield. When you think of a shield, uh, do you ever get the idea of like David, or the King David, when he's a little boy, David, and the Abilene broke in the five little stones he took, and you know he went down there, Goliath had a shield bearer. But his shield was so big, he had to have a second guy. He had to subcontract that out. That subcontract shield bearer, ugh! Here, let me stand in front of Goliath and take any weapon, any spears or any arrows coming after him, right? He's got, it's a protector. A shield is a protector. It means things that are supposed to hurt me, that are meant to hurt me, get deflected. They don't get to get in and hurt me. I am protected. That's what the Lord is. And that's what he told Abram, I am your shield. It's a defensive weapon. If the Lord is the shield to Abram, who would be able to hurt him? Who would be able to take anything away from him? What weapon can hurt him? The answer is 
Nada. Nothing. Your reward will be great. That is another way to translate he, that he would be his shield and his very great reward. That your reward will be great. That God will bless you with a great reward. And that's the second part of that scripture. Look at Abram. He's getting bolder before the Lord. He speaks of his own vision of what is missing in his life. He dares to question the motives and the ways of the Lord and even tries to present a better solution to his problem with this, this Eleazar guy, you know, a hired hand. Well, he'll be my heir, I guess. He's like my, my general in charge of everything. He's like my captain that I, that I have that takes care of all my personal stuff. I guess I'm leaving everything to him. He's telling God, that's, who, that's who's going to get it because I don't have a kid. Please tell me that you've never done that. Please tell me that you've never presented the Lord with a solution to your problem. That is less than what God wants to do for you. Please tell me you, you have not convinced yourself somehow that you're all on your own and that you're going to have to fix this yourself because apparently God is sleeping or he didn't get my heart message that I'm missing something in my life. Abram's getting more like you and I. <laughs> As we read this story of, of blind faith and obedience, I want, I want Abram to say, hey, um, God's got this. And I don't have to worry about it anymore. God's got this. And I don't have to worry about it anymore. Better yet, I want me to say that, that God's got this. I want you to say that God's got this. Do you dare to say it to yourself? Well, I dare you. I double dog dare you. I triple dog dare you. I don't know how many dogs you can put in that or what that even means. But it's an intense dare of you to do that. To say that God will take care of that. Nothing is too big for God to take care of. God tells Abram that not only will you receive an heir, but your descendants will be too many to count. That $2 billion lottery ticket is looking possible right about now. If you believe the story of Abram, Abram would have totally bought into it. $2 billion? No problem. She'll point the way. So the story continues with the Lord giving instructions to Abram as he does exactly what the Lord says. He is totally obedient to the Lord. The Lord makes a covenant with Abram to do everything that he said he would do. I believe that God always does what he promises. Always. I hope none of you have doubted the Lord and what he's capable of doing. But this, this is the truth, guys. He is very, very smart. And we are not. He knows of things that we don't even know about. We're like little two-week-old infants in our knowledge of our world compared to God who made us and made it and made everything in it. We're not capable, really, of putting ideas ahead of God that somehow we are able to take care of ourselves. I've got to wind it up right now, but there is a there cute little story about Sarah getting frustrated with God and saying... I don't have I don't have any babies for well okay take take Hagar she's my servant she kind of makes the bed and she you know she washes the clothes for me and she takes care of things I mean I don't have any babies for her to watch so maybe she can have a baby she's maybe she looks like she might have one here Abram would you mind taking Hagar off you know and whatever you got to do oh I don't want to hear about it but I do want the baby to be mine to give to you it's my servant it's the best I can do Really, that's your, that's your solution? And Abram, what's wrong with Abram at this point? Has he not gone through enough? Has God not shown him enough that he is there, that he's able to do immeasurably more than he could ask or imagine? Yes, the answer is God has done all of that. And still Abram says, okay, that's what you want. That's how we'll do it. Come on, guys, let's not substitute the power of God for some human invention that we might come up with for a minute because we really just need to let him tell us how he's going to do it, right? We got to quit getting in the way of our own blessing. Now, Abram, I love it because God didn't get sick of him. 
I mean, if, it, if I was God and it was him, I'd say, Abram, I, that's enough. You know, you lied to the Pharaoh. You went and did this and you did that. And I told you what was going to happen. You want to put your old servant in front of me that he's going to be your ear. How many times I got to tell you? If I was going to, I'm tired of talking to you, buddy. Straighten up or I'm out of here. That would be me. Aren't you glad I'm not God? <laughs> Aren't you glad? Because I'm not. I'm not capable of being God because God in his infinite mercy. Infinite means he's got so much mercy, we can't get to the bottom of it. More even than the heirs of Abraham. The Arab nation came out of that relationship with Hagar and Abram. Does it make, does it make you kind of upset sometimes to know that what Abram decided to do way back then affects my world today? That ISIS is a part of the fruit of that seed, that part of the, the seed of Abraham? Does that not upset you a little bit? That we're sending our guys off to war for, for our national interest, and then they're getting killed by somebody who just wants death to America. I don't want to go national on you right now, but it kind of it kind of gets me. I can't get away from it. The idea that there are enemies of mine. I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I, I love Abram. That he was just a simple guy, but he made some mistakes that are far-reaching. But one of one of his good things he did was he let the Lord work in him, and uh, he had he did have a son. This is what God says to him in Genesis. And I'll, I'll end with this: seventeen one through eight. When Abram was ninety-nine years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, "I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully." And be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Don't forget, Abram's already wealthy. He's so wealthy, he's got to go find his own almost country with enough grass to feed all the stuffed animals and, and all of the, put the tents up and all the wealth and gold and whatever he's got. He's just wealthy. And God's going to increase him even more than that. Abram fell face down. Here is the worship. And God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will no longer be the father of many. No, you will be the father of many. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you father of many nations. I will make you fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. Wow. Can you imagine hearing that? I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants and after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan. This is coming up because Moses hadn't been born yet. This whole Canaan thing, this is the original promise. The whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting covenant possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God Abram knows that God is the power in his life Abram is face down in worship one thing from this lesson I want you to go home with at some point in your life I want you to when you're by yourself don't do it in front of people to make a show I want you to get on your belly and spread your hands out on the floor. If you have something you want from God, I would like to see that you were able to humble yourself before the mighty power of God and get his attention because he is awesome and he is able to do immeasurably more than you can even ask or imagine. Our minds kind of go so far with what we think we want and God so much farther above that the joy that I share with you is not because you pay me a lot of money to be here the joy that I share with you is seeing something grow and people change before my very eyes because the power of God is for all of us he is for all of us and he loves us as a church as two is in one he loves us all and it is awesome to see the changes that are going about. And if you don't see them, then you're not looking because I see them and they're evident to me. I thank the Lord.
for the privilege and the pleasure of being here today with you. And I thank him for you being here with me today. Try that proscuneo thing. Try it sometime. If it takes you a while to get up, okay. Roll over and pull on something. But get, get down and, and really talk to the Lord and, and make yourself known that he is the power and that you are begging the most powerful being in the universe for something that you would like. And he's got a plan way better than yours. And get ready for it. Get ready to be blessed. The lesson is yours today. I, uh, I, I guess I enjoyed reading the story of Abram, refreshing my memory. I hope this helps you to refresh your memory. I hope this really helps you to understand God's uh, vision for your life. And I hope that you will accept it and, and maybe take my challenge. Let me, let me know how that worked out for you. Would you do that for me? Let, let me know how God is working out in your life. I, I guess.